So hello and welcome to today's session implementing SQL Server DevOps using Azure DevOps. A tell about how the development team and an operations team have to bond together and start using Azure DevOps for SQL deployments. For the next 60 minutes, we'll be talking about Azure DevOps, which allows you to do the full application management lifecycle from creating a work item all the way to its release. We'll be discussing both the cloud and on-premise um, versions of Azure DevOps, as well as its features, including source control, the boards, the pipelines, artifacts, and test plans. And at the end of this session, you will have a basic understanding of the main features of Azure DevOps and how it can be used with SQL Server. In this session, one of us is from the SQL development team and the other from the SQL operations team. Our manager has decided that both teams will merge into one DevOps team so that we're all one big happy family. In reality, this should be a real gradual process. However, this, this is only a 60 minute session. We've taken it upon ourselves to speed up this process. In addition, our manager has decided that the development team lead will become the scrum master and the operations team lead will be the product owner. Now, for those of you who don't know, a product owner is responsible for translating business needs into workable backlog items for Scrum Sprints, which means they must speak to stakeholders at various levels within the business. In addition, they are ultimately responsible for prioritizing those items, even though they may get input about those priorities from various stakeholders. And the Scrum Master's role is to empower the team to do those backlog items by encouraging how they work and removing any imped impediments if they are. Sander, before we go any further, let's introduce ourselves. Let's do that. So my name is Sander. I'm a SQL Server DBA living in the Netherlands. I uh, work for Waypoint Analytical, which is a company based in the United States who do large scale water, soil and plant sampling. I'm a cloud and data center MVP and I'm a major contributor to the DBA Tools project. You can follow me on Twitter. I have a blog. And if you have any questions after this session, please feel free to send me an email. All the demos you'll see today will be available on my GitHub page. Go to the presentations and then uh, find this session and you will have all the demos available for you. You can change them, um, uh, use them uh, for your own teachings, uh, whatever you wanna do with them, they're yours. And now Kevin is going to do his bio, which is slightly more complicated than mine. Well, thank you very much for that, Sander. And on that note, my name is Kevin Chan. I'm a senior database architect living in the Netherlands. However, as you might be able to tell from the accent, I'm originally from the southwest of the UK. However, I live in the Netherlands due to the fact my wife is Dutch. So basically, I'm an Englishman living in the Netherlands working for a French-based company because he met a woman in Australia. Now, whenever I say this out loud, I realise that Sander thinks this is complicated. Now, I have 24 years experience working in IT, and over that time I've worked in various sectors, including the banking, oil and health insurance industries. In fact, I supported databases for companies that are in the top 10 of the Fortune 500 list. Now, I've worked with all versions of SQL Server in one form or another, and I have various certifications, including both the old and the new style MCSE. And more recently, I became a Microsoft Certified DevOps Engineer Expert, which is fairly relevant for this session. Now, as you can also see on my bio, I've recently become a Microsoft Certified Trainer. And in addition to that, I've been a Data Platform MVP for just now. Now, like Sander, I'm also on social media as well. I'm on Twitter, at Kev Chant. My LinkedIn has got a user-friendly URL of Kevin-Chant. I have my own blog, and my email address is available upon request. Anyway, Sander, the first thing to discuss is whether to use Azure DevOps Cloud Services or Azure DevOps Server. 
For those of you who are not aware of the difference, Azure DevOps Cloud Services is the new name for Visual Studio Team Services. And Azure DevOps Server is the new name for TFS, which is the application that you install on premises to do your application lifecycle management. It has now been rebranded to look and feel just like the cloud-based Azure DevOps Cloud Services. Now, Sander, personally, I'd like to use the Azure DevOps Server so that we can handle a security better on premises. Plus, it means we get to keep the backend SQL Server databases and we can do reporting that just is not available in Azure DevOps Cloud Services. However, the downside is we'd have to build one or more servers with Azure DevOps Server installed for business continuity reasons. Plus, we may have to wait a while for new features to become available because of the Cloud First strategy. In addition to that, we'd have to maintain and patch all those servers. But if you use the Azure DevOps services in the cloud instead, you wouldn't have to patch and maintain anything. That's all, all of that is maintained by Microsoft in the background for you. Plus, it's easier to install extensions from the marketplace. That's true, and we can still secure it in Azure. Besides, whichever we use, we still have to consider security and compliance anyway to keep our auditors happy. Luckily, Azure DevOps is well structured and easy to manage. So the main point we want you to take away from this section is that if you install Azure DevOps Server, you'd have to maintain and patch everything yourself. As where the cloud-based version, it's all maintained in the background for you. So let's have a look and see how Azure DevOps Cloud Services actually looks. And as you can see here, Azure DevOps has its own hierarchy. At the top, you have an icon which represents your service, which has access to one or more organizations, which you can see on the left-hand side here. Now, these organizations can be a company that you work for, or if you work for a large enterprise, it can be just a division within it. Or alternatively, it can be an organization that you've created yourself for testing purposes, like you can see here. Now, if you have the right permissions, you can change various organization settings as well. So for example, you can do things here like change the name and also the privacy URL towards it. However, if you do change the name, just bear in mind that all the URLs for everything used in that organization will all be completely different. You can also view your projects as well, as well as some other interesting general uh, feature settings that you can change. In addition to that, you can set some policies at organization level and fine tune some permissions. A fairly important one is for boards, where you can manage your processes and we'll talk about processes a bit more in the session. Now, an interesting one that you can change here for repositories is that you can change the default branch name for new repositories at the whole organization level. So as some of you are probably aware, there has been a bit of controversy as of late as to the origins of the master branch naming convention. So now Microsoft allows you to change it. There's various pipeline settings you can change at the organization level as well. And you can view the overall amount of storage that all of your artifacts are using within your organization. Now, if I go back to the home page of your organization, you can see that each organization can have one or more projects, which can contain one or more teams, which we'll show in a bit. If you see, as you can see here, we've actually created a project called DPS 2020 with the actual event logo as well. And just like organization settings, you can change various project settings as well if you have the right permissions. So, for example, again, you can change the name of the project, you can change the logo as well. In addition to that, you can manage your teams, as you can see if I click on teams here. And if I click on the default team, you can see I can 
manage the members within there. Another useful feature in project settings as well is that it can fine tune permissions for teams and logical groups that are created within Azure DevOps. So for example, if I click on the default team again, you can see I can fine tune permissions there. Uh, some more interesting settings as well, for example, service hooks, which allows me to create service hooks in the third party application. So I would click on create subscription. You can see a whole host of services here, including Jenkins and Microsoft Teams. There's also various settings relating to boards that we can change. And some interesting settings relating to pipelines, we can also change like agent pools, which we'll again cover later on. There's some repository settings that you can change as well. And again, if you don't have permissions to change the default branch name at the organization level, you get the chance to be able to change it at the project level instead. You can view how much space your artifacts are storing at a project level as well. And also some interesting settings relating to your test plans. That all looks very cool. Remember, there are other things we can configure as well if we dive even deeper into these settings. So the main point we want you to take away from this section is how Azure DevOps is structured. Anyway, now we've covered the main admin stuff. Let's cover version control options with Azure Repos, which is a feature uh, in Azure DevOps. You mean like so safe? Maybe something a little bit more modern since Azure Repos supports multiple version control systems. We are probably going to use something like Git. Well, then you'd be for your development work there, right? Because it sounds like version control would be complicated for the ops folks to learn. Well, actually, if you if you start using it, you uh, with your ops team, you will uh, see that they will actually start to perform better. At my company, we've started to put all our scripting and all our processes into source control, which is shared along the entire IT department. Well, I'm always going for performing better, Sander. Tell me more. Well, like I said, Azure DevOps supports multiple version control systems like uh, TFVC and Git. But because we want to have a distributed version control system, um, Git is going to be the best choice for us. Okay, so what about branching strategies? Because I hear they're pretty important. Yeah, they are. And well, there, there are various ones we can use. For example, there's the Git flow and the GitHub flow. Well, what's the main difference between those two? Because they sound pretty similar to me. They are pretty similar, and the major difference between the two is, is that with the Git flow, you don't directly merge into the main branch unless it's a hotfix. With the GitHub workflow, there's no development branch and there are only feature branches. And after a successful test, they, the feature branches get merged into the main branch straight away. And us devs have been using control for many years. So if we do something like pair programming between Dev and Ops members, they can probably get used to it. Peer programming? No, pair programming. This is where two people literally sit next to each other and work on the same code. And I know with the COVID situation nowadays, that might be a bit of a problem because you can't really sit next to each other. Uh, but research has shown it usually takes a bit longer to do. However, it means you end up with more stable code and people learn uh, new coding practices better and more efficient. Wouldn't that mean there's a lot of overhead in terms of that practice? Well, you would think that and you would also be correct. There is about 15% overhead involved with this practice. But that overhead is largely compensated with the increased quality of code, which means less bug fixes. And we all know bug fixes take a lot of time because we have to roll back everything we did. And that takes a lot of time. 
Um, of course, there are other methods we can use like code reviews. And at the end of the day, we just have to experiment with each practice and see what works best for us. OK, so what's to stop somebody coding their own release and pushing it straight to the main branch? I'm glad you asked. It looks like Azure DevOps has branching policies we can use. One of which is that two people have to approve the updates to the main branch. Well, that sounds good. I think we need to do that to be SOX compliant anyway, since we deal with financial data. In fact, I actually have Azure DevOps open already. Why don't we look and see if we can do that? Mm -hmm. So, for those of you who aren't aware, this is how a Git repository looks visually in Azure repos. So all of this is basically files of code. Now, there's other features within Azure repos as well. There's commit, which allows you to visually see your commit history for your Git repository. Pushes, there's branches, so you can view all your various branches there. And of course, tags can be used as well to tag things that are significant within your repository. And the only thing that is significant for today is, of course, DPS 2020. Mm -hmm. And you can also view your pull requests. Now, if you want to be SOX compliant, of course, they want you to have at least a four eye principle in place. To do that in Azure DevOps, you go to branches, click on the ellipsis of your main branch, and then go and select branch policies. And now to have the four eye principle in place, you would set your minimum number of reviewers to be at least two. And the other thing you'd have to do as well is to automatically include reviewers. So for example, if I click on the plus sign and then click on reviewers, you can see I can add Sander. So you can get an email every time I raise a pull request. Nice. And these are the main points we want you to take away from this section about Azure repos. Azure DevOps supports multiple version control systems. However, um, if you have the choice, um, it has become the facto standard. So I would choose Git um, if you had to start with. Um, you can secure your updates with branching policies like Kevin just showed us. And Git also hooks very nicely into other um, tools from Microsoft like Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio itself or Azure, Azure Data Studio or short ADS. Indeed, and on that note, talking of Azure Data Studio, you can actually now use Azure Data Studio to manage your database projects as well. Oh, so I will show you now how that looks. So for example here, let's actually change the appearance and zoom in a little bit for everybody. What you can do in Azure Data Studio, like I was saying, you can now manage your database projects. And this is how they actually look in Azure Data Studio. Now, this isn't in Azure Data Studio by default. You have to have the latest version installed. And you also have to make sure that you have a particular extension installed called Database Projects. As you can see here. And of course, as Sandra pointed out, once you make changes to your database project, you can then sync it with your repository that's stored in Azure repos. So anyway, now I've gone through that, Sandra, we better discuss Azure boards, since I'm gonna be using it to organize our backlog items. Now, Azure boards can use basic, agile, scrum, or CMMI templates for each project you create in Azure DevOps. As I mentioned earlier, towards the start of the session, these templates are actually called a process within Azure DevOps. Because we're using Scrum Sander, we'll probably want to use the Scrum process. For now, we can keep that process as standard, but we can customize the various processes if we want to by doing things like adding extra columns. So if we go back to Azure DevOps again, 
I can show you Azure Boards now. So what I'll just quickly do now is go through the default features you get with Azure DevOps. So you have work items, which allows you to view all of your different work items in a linear format. So for example, if I remove this example, you'll see it shows you a linear list of all your objects, including your test plans. And as you saw just now, one really good thing that you can do within work items is filter the few removed items. So if you think somebody's removed something by accident, you can look for it in here. Next, there's boards, which allows you to show you, allows you to see your outstanding work in a Kanban or Scrum Band kind of way. So those who have worked with either of those in the past will see this board is very familiar. And like other board solutions, you can customize these boards here. For example, you can set all of your work items to have different colors depending on what tags they have. And you can also customize your columns and your swim lanes. Now, backlogs will actually show you your outstanding backlog items. So if I click here, for example, you can see a long linear list of all your outstanding work, which can be very useful. Now, if you're working with Scrum, you'll probably be more keen to use the Sprint's task board, which shows you all the tab backlog items and tasks that you're working on in the current Sprint. And as you can see, some of these objects actually do need to be moved towards the done state, which can easily be done by using a drag and drop. And there's other interesting things you can do on the sprint board as well. And finally, there's queries, which we will actually cover a bit more in depth shortly. OK. Um, but how are the backlog items organized for Scrum? Well, that's a very good question. If you're working with Scrum and Azure DevOps, basically, you can have one or more epics. Each epic can have one or more features, which in turn has one or more backlog items. And if you're working with sprints, there's various tasks you can work on for these items during the sprint. Now, if you were to use Agile instead, Sander, it would actually be user stories instead of backlog items here. Okay. So how do you propose we use the boards? I mean, if you just have all the backlog items in one big list, it's going to be pretty cluttered, right? Yeah, I see what you mean just by looking at it here. And that's why I propose we start giving backlog items sensible tags that we can filter on. So how will we know when an item is ready to go into a sprint? Well, we can tag items as being refined once it's met all the criteria. Another option is that we can set the backlog item to be in the approved state. By the way, everybody, the standard criteria for an item to be classed as refined in Scrum is that the item is clear and small enough to be part of a sprint. However, businesses can have their own criteria for when an item is refined and ready for sprint as well. That all sounds good, um, but hang on a minute. I've seen that we have various filters on the backlog board, but you can't show items that don't have a certain tag. How will we know when, when an item, what items are left to be refined? Oh yeah, I think I see what you mean here. If I click on the tags, there's a no option. And an and check option. However, it doesn't appear to be a not option here. So it's a very interesting one. We have a few options here. However, I recommend that we use beautiful queries to show any backlog items that do not have the refined tag. Of course, they're not called beautiful queries, it's just a nickname for them. So if we click here on queries, for example, you can see here's one I created earlier. And if I click on there, you can see there's a backlog item that does not appear to have the refined tag. Now, 
if I click on editor here, you will see a query designer, which probably looks very familiar to a lot of you who've worked with query designers over the years. In addition to that, if you have an extension called Wickle Editor installed within Azure DevOps, you can actually edit the query language that the queries use, and that, of course, is called Wickle. And I like using this, Sander, because I find it very flexible. By, on a side note, by the way, going back to your query just now about this, uh, English guy living abroad actually did raise a request with Microsoft at some stage to have the not check option there. However, due to the lack of popularity, they decided not to go ahead with it, which I fully understand. I wonder what that could be. Anyway, talking about sprints, how do you propose we align our Kanban mat to, to our to your backlog item? I mean, our items usually only last a couple of days. Well, if they only last a couple of days, it can potentially be converted to a backlog item. Fair enough. And how are we going to know what our sprint goal is, though? Well, we can add an extension to Azure DevOps, which allows you to have one. So if I quickly click here and on the shopping bag item and click on Browse the Marketplace, And now I just click and go here and click on the search. You can see there's actually an extension here called the Sprint Go, which you can use to. And then once you actually install that extension on the Sprint board, you will have the option to be able to set a Sprint Go and put in more details about it if you want to, which is pretty good. Cool. So I'm Guessing we're still going to use our other application to manage the boards in, in the meantime until we get a good look at Azure boards. I'm going to go back to my DBA answer here, and it depends. <laughs> if, the, if the company is OK for us to keep using it, that's fine. However, if they decided to go all in with Azure DevOps, we can still use our other application to manage the boards for a while whilst we get used to Azure DevOps. However, personally, I recommend ripping the Band-Aid off and doing the migration as soon as possible, though, to take advantage of all the integration that Azure Boards has with everything else within Azure DevOps. By the way, Sander, did I mention all the analytics and preview features we can potentially use with Azure Boards? There they are. We only have 60 minutes for this session, so. Ah, good point. People are just have to watch our other session elsewhere to see us using Azure Boards more. Anyway, the main point we want you to take away from this section is that Azure Boards is a very powerful way of managing Scrum or Agile work visually, especially if you're a product owner. OK, let's talk about Azure Pipelines, which is where we're, uh, we'll look at how, um, build and deploy our deliverables. So how would this work with SQL Server? Well, we could look uh, to deploy either using state-based or migration-based deployments. Well, what's the main difference between those two? Well, state-based kind of describes what it does. It, it deploys the entire state of your project at that point and it checks for changes and applies them. Whereas with migration based, it looks at where the last change has been and then creates an incremental script uh, with the changes in there. Uh, and you deploy those scripts incrementally. And migration based can be good, but if there's a problem, we'd have to redeploy all over from the start again. And so I think in our situation, it's better to use state based. And it's fairly easy to do and to create a, such a project uh, for SQL Server, uh, as I will demonstrate right now. So I'm going to take over the screen. I'm going to open this one. 
So what I did when I had to do all the projects at my current company, uh, we had over 35 databases and I didn't want to create that SSTT solution with multiple projects every single time. So you have to go to file, new, and then solution, put in the name, and it's going to be the same every single time. So what I did was I used the PS module development PowerShell module, which is part of the PS framework. And this is a, a PowerShell module you can download from the PS gallery for free. And it's able to create templates for not just files, but entire directory structures. So because an SSDT solution is an entire directory with files and there are multiple subdirectories, I could create a template for that. And when we look at this, the most important part is where uh, it's going to download my template from my GitHub page. And then in the all below, there's a command called info PSMD template. And once a template name, it wants the output path and a project name. And in this case, it's going to be somewhere on my disk and it's called unit testing. So if I run that script, it's going to download this template from my GitHub page. So I always have the most, uh, most up-to-date version. And this is free, by the way, you can use it uh, just the same, it's all out there. So it's already created my entire template. Let's open that one going to open Visual Studio. It's going to build my project. And now I have my project all over here. So as you can see, I have two projects within there. I've got the data, which is my data model, and I've got my project for all my unit tests, which is going to be T sql T. And if I do uh, an import, I can just get my database, select a connection. Nope, not that one, this one. Well, a browse. Local hosts. Then I come on, work with me. There we are. Connect. and start. This is not supposed to happen. Let's connect to my... Yeah, got everything there. Well, there seems to be a problem there, but it should import these objects. And I can, after I imported the objects, I can do a build from everything uh, from there. Back to you, Kevin. Okay. Thanks, uh, Sander. Um, so what about unit tests? Because I know we can do that for other programming languages within Azure DevOps. Well, I did a similar kind of thing. Uh, I automated my basic unit tests. And what I did there was I wanted to, uh, to do some basic tests, like if my objects are there, is my table there, is my store procedure there? Does my table have the correct columns? Does my uh, store procedure has correct parameters with the correct data type and all those kind of things. And they all are pretty similar 
uh, in their approach. So I can just iterate through them and then based on a couple of templates, create unit tests for them. So I created a PowerShell module called the PST SQL T test generator. The script for that looks a bit like this. I'm going to open that one. Big. So it's called the PST SQL T test generator. It's available on the PS gallery. And the most important command is the info PST T test generator. You point it to an instance point it to a database and then an output path. And in this case, it's going to be my SCTT solution I just created. So if I run that little script, it's going to connect to my database and say, OK, I've got all these objects and it's going to iterate through all these tests. As you can see, there's a progress bar in there. So you can actually see what the progress is. There we go. One part. Now it does stuff for the function parameters. And that will continue all the way through all the objects in there. And it will generate like a four or five different tests per object depends on what you have, but uh, you could easily end up with a couple of hundred of these and you could never make these manually faster. I want to emphasize though, you don't run this script for your entire database every single time. What you want to do is you do this uh, on your initial creation of your project, and then you either do this for a single object because you have the choice in there in the parameters, or you just copy it from an already existing, existing test that you have. In the meantime, I just want to see if it's already done. Yes, it is. And from here you can do, uh, because I have a test basic uh, folder already in here, I can just say add existing item. I can go to my test basic folder because I signed that in my scripts, say add, and now I have all my tests in my project. And from here, I can build this, uh, this test project with all my tests inside and then run the T-SQL tests from there. So you can get started with unit testing right away. Back to you, Kevin. Well, oh, thanks for that, Sander. And I'm just gonna take the screen again, if that's okay. Go ahead. So, for those of you who may have noticed earlier, what Sander actually showed you in his Visual Studio uh, database project is actually the same code that is here in Azure repos, just so you know exactly how the end product looks. Anyway, Sander, I've seen that we can use GUI tasks or YAML for our pipelines. I'm just wondering, which should we use? Well, the GUI is good for exploring things, but in the end, it's going to be converted to YAML anyway. And if you select an option on the in the from the marketplace and fill in all the properties that you have to set, it's going to convert it to YAML right into your pipeline. So I I would just say that just start using YAML because the GUI is not that easy to use I mean, anyway. Yeah, I think it is good for demos mostly yeah. these days. And actually, I remember you showed me that earlier. In fact, whilst you were explaining to everybody about T SQL T, I multitasked a little bit and um, I made some updates to the YAML pipeline that you created. Luckily, it actually created something called an agent locally on my laptop, which we will cover shortly. Anyway, I just wanted to go through this with you, Sander, because like I said, I built on the pipeline that you created. Nice. So as you can see here, here's the build and the unit testing that was automatically created with uh, 
your PowerShell from GitHub. From there, I actually added some what they call stages in Azure DevOps as well. So I actually added an integration stage so we could simulate uh, integration tests into a Docker container that's running SQL Server. Then from there, I also created a staging environment, which is an environment intended to use for UAT tests. And then finally, of course, there was a production environment that I also deployed SQL Server updates to. Now, as you probably noticed as well, Sandra, I did create some other stages as well whilst you were talking away. So I actually synced the repo with uh, GitHub so that it would actually kick off a GitHub action workflow as well. So that would deploy updates to another database. However, we won't show that in this session because this session is based on Azure DevOps. And also, as you may see here, Sandra, rather interestingly, I've also set up a way to deploy a DAT pack from exactly the same database project you created to Azure DevOps, um, not Azure DevOps, Azure SQL Database as well. Nice. Uh, and as you can see, I actually created a separate, what's called a, a separate DAT pack in what's called an artifact, which is a deliverable within Azure DevOps. And I can actually show you how that's done quickly now. And it's a very simple way that I did it. I basically created another stage that manipulated the original database project. And in this stage, it actually copied the files to a, another subfolder in the artifacts directory. And from there, it ran some PowerShell to rename the project and to rename the DSP line in the SQL Podge file. So it changed it automatically to an Azure SQL database format. And then from there, it was just merely a case of building the project again using the new SQL Podge file with the new database schema provider set and publishing it, which we saw just now. And you're probably wondering how this actually looks. So if we go back into Azure Data Studio and I go to click back and explore here and then go from there to connections as well. This is, if I click on refresh, this is the integration database from the staging environment. Here is the database from the staging environment here. It appears I've lost the connection settings for this one, bear with me. Seems like there's two of us having database issues today. <laughs> so this is the production database that was deployed through the Azure pipeline that we saw just now. Here is another database that was deployed using a GitHub action based on exactly the same repo. And Deja Vu here. You can just click on remember password. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I'm very security aware though. Mm -hmm. It's always on my mind. Anyway, here is the database. Here is the database in Azure SQL database, I should say, which is updated using the other DAT pack that was created, which is based on Azure SQL database. Nice. So that's it. And obviously, as you know from before, I kind of nickname it the Kevin method because it's simple yet effective. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to Azure DevOps, just to show why it's so effective, it's actually because this is just all completely based from this one database project. So you don't have to maintain multiple copies of your database project in future. Nice. So just to give you some more info about that is that 
when you use the template that I demonstrated earlier, you will also have the same, uh, and you will have a Azure Pipelines YAML file created in the build directory right there for you. You can just import that one and start using the Azure Pipelines. And it does a Docker build and a test. That's all your tests that you uh, put it in for so both SQL Server 2017 and 2019. Um, but of course, for SQL deployments, you can also call PowerShell instead from YAML to handle your deployments if you're dealing with a large number of servers. Well, how do we know if that worked? Well, we could simply get PowerShell to output XML in the JUnit test result format and then allow Azure DevOps uh, to use the XML in a task which publishes the test results to view the results visually. Of course, we can put other feedback mechanisms in place for deployments as well. We can do that? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, so if we go back to the pipelines a minute, and I go back to edit one, or your one, I should say, are we limited to these tasks that we can see here on the right hand side? Nope. Um, in fact, you can install loads of additional extensions from the marketplace. Um, of course, because we are an enterprise company, we may have to request to install them instead, uh, instead of being able to install them straight away, uh, which is you usually do uh, with whichever team manages the Azure DevOps organization for the entire enterprise. I didn't realize that was a thing. Oh yeah, and but it does mean we can get the uh, help with those security and compliance issues you were talking about earlier. Okay, well I've seen that we can use Microsoft hosted agents even within our own network on premises. However, it does mean if we use those that we'd have a lot of issues internally. For example, we'd have to raise a, a lot of firewall requests. So maybe we're better off building our own agents internally. Maybe, but remember a lot of us are developers and we don't want to build our own servers. Plus we'd have to figure out exactly what software we need to install on those agents and maintain them. Well, right? Well, necessarily. So as you can all see here, Microsoft actually provides a guide for how you can install these particular agents on your machine. And the reason that the GitHub repository for it is called GitHub Actions Virtual Environments is because you can actually use the same image for GitHub Action Runners as well. Nice. Well, if we're going to do that, we might as well run the agent through the command line instead of using it as a service. How come? Oh, everybody knows when running something through the command line, you get more detailed results. OK, well, as you know, I tested this earlier. Let's see the results on the next slide. Behold. Not much there. OK. Um, next part, test plans. Um, this is where we can do, uh, as soon as we've done in our initial build and release, we can do use test plans uh, to do our testing uh, in a more efficient way. Don't they all have to be automated though? Because that would take a lot of effort for some items. Not necessarily. Your test plans can, can have multiple steps as well, which is where you can you can test this yourself. OK, well, in that case, I will have a quick look. Ah. Okay, well, I see there's a test plan from somewhere else here. So, 
what I can do if I click on one for web application here. Oh yeah. And you can insert pictures into these test plans as well, I see. Mm -hmm. And if I click on it. So, say for example, if I was to click on the cross then and type in an issue and then type in create bug, I wonder if that will actually create the bug with. Oh, so it actually tells you the first step if you go to create a bug. Nice, right? All integrated. Indeed, very nice. And there's other things we can do as well, like take screenshots or record ourselves with audio with these test plans as well. And then, of course, we can also see progress reports for the test plans and test cases that we run, as well as some other configuration settings. You can also install a local version of the web browser window that pops up called a Microsoft Test Runner application. However, if you do that, just be aware that it wants to appear on the far left hand side on whichever monitor you've got set for your main monitor. So if you're going to use that, you're going to have to change your display properties to change your main monitor potentially. OK, powerful stuff. So we better discuss artifacts here, which is where we we can share various things like Nougat packages with other users within our Azure DevOps organization. Um, for example, if you create a Nougat package, I can share this uh, within Azure Artifact your artifacts for others to use. Ah. Well, it's strange because I couldn't do anything with them before when I tested something new with the organization I got for free, my Visual Studio subscription. That's probably because you sometimes have to go to your Visual Studio subscription benefits page to set them up. Okay. Actually, on that note, it does remind me to tell you all that you are eligible to create your own Azure DevOps organization to test things on. And if you have a Visual Studio subscription, it can bring you extra benefits as well. This is just in case you want to test things without the fear of breaking your company's Azure DevOps organization. Anyway, just to show you, this is how artifacts look within Azure DevOps. And you can think of these different artifacts uh, a bit like Linux repositories. You create a feed for each one, and then you can populate some of your packages there. To be honest, Sander, there's other features I'm looking forward to the team using as well. If we go back in, for example, like the various dashboards that we can use. So you can use a dashboard like this so as part of your daily standups every day. There's also analytics views. And basically all of these different data sets you can see here can be uh, used to populate Power BI dashboards. And I've actually used this myself already to reproduce a sprint review dashboard in Power BI. There's also a CLI that you can use if you're really keen on using command line. Cool. And yeah, and other things like that. So, um, that looks great in a great way to manage our products from the command line, uh, lovers like me, uh, like myself. So, where shall we begin? Well, I suggest that we start by getting both teams together and explain to them what we're trying to achieve. Anyway, this is all we've got time for today. Um, and if there are any questions, feel free to send either Kevin or me a question. Uh, well, you can I follow. Think, I think people can actually ask us questions. We'll be sticking around for a while here yep. as well i do believe so you can ask us some questions uh, and whilst people are thinking of questions to use there are a couple of other slides that we have to bring up for yourselves as well so i will just go through those now slowly while someone's asking questions <laughs> 